Greeks Valley Free Family. As, uh, as we're recording this, I'd say good morning, Valley Free Family. I, I trust you're all doing well. And in light of our ever-changing circumstances, I, I wish we could be all together in this room. I wish we could all be worshiping together, but that's not possible today. So I'm grateful for the opportunity to come into your living room today and be with you and your family and, and whoever is with you. So blessings to you. I've observed in my own life this week that, that my perspective on this situation seems to be always in flux. One moment is fear, another moment it's resignation, while, while other times are marked by faith and confidence. And as an aside, I've noticed a leveling off of my emotions whenever I turn the TV off and stop watching the news and dig into God's word. I'm guessing there's a correlation with that. Now, I can't claim any expertise. I don't have any training in, in psychology. I'm not a doctor of psychology. But at the same time, we can say with certainty that all of us will experience a range of emotions and perspectives over the coming days. Trauma, and, and that's what we're living in today, trauma leads to a roller coaster of responses. Shock, fear, agitation, anger, grief, despondency, and even surges of confidence and certainty, as we've said already. So I met with a new doctor this last week, and I had an extensive exam and an, and an interview with her. And she later sent me a text with some instructions, uh, follow-up instructions, and, and she made an interesting observation. She said that I seemed a little bit overwhelmed that day, and I didn't even realize it, but it was plain to her. So don't be surprised if life and emotions seem a little unpredictable right now. Give yourself room to ride the wave of emotions. Brothers and sisters, give yourselves grace to sort life out these days. Another thing I've observed in these, in these uh, last few days is, that my, is my need to get back to familiar ground. Like never before, I and we are longing for a sense of stability, a sense of confidence, the days and times in which we live compel us to search for foundations, to search for immovable truths that we can lay hold of, that we can grasp firmly. So last week we opened up the book of 1 Peter and we looked at the first few verses of chapter one and Peter writes, to, writes his letter to people who are living as Christians in a pagan world. They're also facing tremendous times of uncertainty and, and the possibility, the very real possibility of coming persecution. And so last week we did a, a, a big picture, a, a 40,000 foot flyover of Peter's thoughts. But I feel as the week has progressed, I feel like we need to stop and take a deeper look, a deeper dive at what Peter has to say to us. Now the people that Peter wrote to might have lived in a different time. They might have lived in a different place, but their hearts, their emotions, and their fears were likely the same or similar to those that we face in our world of sudden upheaval. They needed a confident word. They needed someone to come and speak a clarifying word of faith, a confident word of faith. They needed a shot of confidence in very uncertain, in a very uncertain world. So today, I feel it warrants a further study. What word did God give the Apostle Peter? What word did he give him that would bring comfort and confidence to an audience that was overwhelmed by uncertainty? We're only taking the first two, first two verses this morning. But there's a lot in there. So take out your notebooks. Take some notes this morning. Take out your Bibles. Make some notes in your Bible. And let's, let's walk through it. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Let me read it. First Peter chapter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. There's a lot in these few words as Peter introduces his letter. 
But if we're going to have confidence in our communication, if we're going to have confidence in a message that comes to us, we have to have confidence in the source of that message. Uh, probably like you, I have a thousand emails. I, I embellish a little bit. I have a thousand emails in my inbox. And each one, it seems, claims to have an insight into the current crisis. So now I, I, I learned to, 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 to flip through all those email messages and I only go to the ones where I know the author, where I know the blog, where I know the source and I have confidence in the source. Peter introduces his letter by describing himself. You see, a confident word needs to come from a reliable source. He says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. The word apostle has a simple meaning. It just simply means messenger. But after the resurrection and, and, and around the day of Pentecost and the first days of the church, the term took on much more weight. When Jesus commissioned his 12 disciples, he made them to be apostles. That means that they were envoys to this newborn church and, and to the world. It meant that they were commissioned directly by the Lord Jesus Christ. It meant that they were qualified as envoys because they had been taught directly by Jesus Christ. And because Jesus commissioned them, they had the authority of Jesus behind them and their words and their letters. It means that they wrote down the gospel and that what they wrote for the New Testament was indeed the word of God. One commentator noted that none of the other offices or gifts include the tagline of the Lord Jesus Christ. That tagline is reserved for apostles only. So these simple words of introduction lend a weight to what will follow. This is an envoy of God, an envoy of Jesus Christ speaking the truth of God. In several places in the New Testament, the apostles stress the, the source of their teaching. In 1 Corinthians 2, verse 13, Paul said this, the apostle Paul said this, we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Peter himself said that Paul's teaching was hard to understand, but they were indeed scripture. John wrote in Revelation 22 the familiar idea that whoever adds or takes away from any of the words in this revelation, in this word, are subject to the judgment of God. So why is this important? Our world has slowly descended, maybe not so slowly, descended into a cacophony of voices. Voices that claim truth and knowledge, but in fact, we find it more and more difficult to discern who we can trust and who we can't. Plus, when events and circumstances turn on a dime as they have in the last couple of weeks, we long for a clear word. We long for someone, someone to offer clarity and unchangeable truth in our lives. So Peter begins to his readers, begins speaking to his readers that that's us today by letting us know that what he is writing is coming from the very heart of God. It's coming from an envoy of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of God. It can be trusted. It is unchanging. It is profitable for life and godliness. It is clarity, it is assurance, and it is hope for you and your family today. Now, there's another aspect here in, in this idea that I'd like to draw out for us this morning. I think it has everything to do with where we are today. You see, Peter is claiming his role. He says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's an apostle. He's an envoy. He's an authority in the things of which he writes and speaks. Peter asserts all these things with his readers. And I wonder, as I put myself in Peter's place and I, and I put myself in my own world, I wonder if we don't need to step up to our roles as well. The first wedding that I performed after returning from our, our time in Romania, first wedding that I performed showed me all about this idea 
and I'll never forget it. I went to the rehearsal assuming that the wedding coordinator, I didn't, didn't know this, so I am claiming ignorance, but I went to the wedding rehearsal the, the night before the wedding, and, and I expected the wedding coordinator, who was managing everything, to run the rehearsal. I didn't know that it was the pastor's job to run the rehearsal. So I calmly sat at the front of the room while the wedding party was in some sort of chaos and confusion out there, and, and uh, I waited for the wedding coordinator to take charge. And it slowly descended into a chaos that might be overstating it, but it just was confusion. And finally the bride turned to me and she said, will you please take charge? And so I did. I said, you do this, you do that, let's come up here, let's go through this. I took charge, I assumed my role, and everything went well after that. In my role as police chaplain, I've learned to go into situations with that attitude, that as a chaplain, I have a role. And as the stated role is that we are to bring light into a very difficult situation. And so when I go in as a pastor, as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ, as an envoy of Jesus Christ, I go in there deliberately to watch, to listen, and then in the right moment to assert my role into the situation, and God honors that. It's always true, but even more so today, we need clear voices. We need officials to lead. We need pastors to be pastors. We need dads to be dads. We need moms to be moms. And we need neighbors to be neighbors. Our churches, our families, our kids, and our neighborhoods are waiting for us to fulfill our roles as Christ followers. Brothers and sisters, a clarion voice is needed in your world. I'd like to move deeper into the passage if I could, and I believe that Peter lays out a confident foundation for us. Peter addresses his audience as he goes farther. After he says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and he begins to lay out the foundation, and he begins by identifying them, as listen to this, to those who are elect exiles. To those who are elect exiles. So what does that mean? Someone has said that those two words, elect exiles, are a sermon unto themselves, maybe two sermons. Let's look at it. The word elect, it simply means that they're chosen by God. They are citizens of heaven. You see, the idea sets up two very distinct people groups, the chosen and the not chosen. And Jewish believers would have immediately thought of the people of Israel in the Old Testament and how God had set them aside, had God, God had called them out, God had given them a status of chosen people. And Peter says it again in, in chapter 2, verse 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. That's our identity. We are the elect. We are the chosen. So we're going to come back to this idea in a few minutes, but for now, I want you to know that Peter is establishing their identity as special, as chosen by God, set apart for his calling and his purpose. That is part of the foundation that we need to cling to. The next word is exiles. So what comes to your mind when you think about the word exile? The stranger in a strange place? Somewhere where you, you don't belong? And my reference point is our experience as missionaries going to another culture. What was it like to live outside of your own culture, outside of your own home, away from your own home? You're away from those who care about you. You're away from those you care about. There's a sense of loneliness. There's a sense of, even in the midst of all the adventure of going to a different place, there's a sense of we're on our own. You find yourself in strange surroundings. You find yourself in a different culture with new norms. In fact, everything is new. We had to learn how to find food. We had to learn how to speak the language. We had to learn how to save potatoes so that we could get potatoes at the market. We had to learn the language, simple language, just to survive. And beyond that, we had to learn the cultural do's and don'ts. We had to discern what our identities in Christ were and how they would fit and when they wouldn't fit. Everything was challenged. 
Everything was new. Everything was unsettling. Everything was confusing. So what do you do when you're in exile? You reach out for something familiar. You search, and, and sometimes you search desperately to find something you know and connects you with home. You might laugh at me, and I fully expect you would, but for us, that little touch was a, a, can, of, a can of planter's cheese balls. I, my son actually gave me one he found in a store recently. We, we haven't seen him for years, and all of a sudden he found him. I meant to bring it this morning, and I forgot it, but planter's cheese balls. They didn't appear, but once in a while, and when they did, we scarfed them up. Sometimes when we received a package from, from far away home, we would hope that it had a great big jar of peanut butter in it. And Sandy, my wife Sandy, for her, the world was spinning on its axis when someone would send her red licorice. That's a something from home, anything. And my Bible translation says elect exiles, but the word exile sounds forced or compelled. In the same way, the word stranger is sometimes used, but that indicates that no one knew them. That indicates that, that they were just walking as strangers in the midst of another group of people that they didn't know. The reality is that some of the exiles that Peter was writing to, some of them might have grown up in these places. The fact is that they, they probably were known. The culture was known, so why does Peter call them exiles? Because, as he will explain later, their identity is that of citizen of heaven, family of God, children of God. You see, no matter what their passport said, no matter what their driver's license said, no matter what their home address said, they were citizens of heaven, and their home was not where they lived. He would remind them of that over and over and over again in his letter. So the better translation, better than better than elect exiles, is that of alien or sojourner. I love the word sojourner. It simply means a temporary resident in a foreign place. Our circumstances today are not all that different. Everything comfortable has been challenged. The future is uncertain. We have this urge to get back to the truth, to fundamental assurances and promises. We long to be in church worshiping with others. We long to be in our life groups. We long to be in our step groups. We long to be in our crux group. We long to be in our Sunday school classes. We long to be with other believers. You see, as exiles, as sojourners, we long to connect with home. You see, Peter knows the heart of an exile. Now, there's another truth that makes it the foundation of an exile. Verse 2, he says this, according to to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now, talk about a word that's full of meaning. We could spend a lot of time right here on this one word, this idea of foreknowledge. But right here, this idea of foreknowledge goes beyond the simple knowing of a fact. It's not just that God knows. The word foreknowledge implies planning. It implies, it implies foresight. It implies purpose. And beyond that, related to God, it pictures him as a father who knows and loves his children. And being eternal, we know that he chose us before the foundation of the world. I think it's worth turning over to Ephesians chapter 1. Listen to this, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Verse 4, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. We could go on. Ephesians chapter 1 is well worth your meditation today if you're looking for a foundation. But let's go back to the idea of foreknowledge. See, if we had the luxury of two-way conversation here today, and you know at Valley Free we, we love that interaction during sermon time, and I miss that. But if we had that going on today, we would probably, there's a good chance we'd get wrapped around the axle on this topic. It, this topic includes God's choice, God's sovereignty, 
God's foreknowledge, God's predestination, human free will, they all go into this conversation. But I'm trying not to make that our focus today. I hope we can agree with Peter that God chose us, no matter how he did it, but he chose us. And he has a chosen people who he calls his own. And he knew all of this before the creation of the world, before the foundations of the world. It was all his plan, it was all his purpose, and it was all his outcome. That's where we live today. But brothers and sisters, you have been chosen by God. In his foreknowledge, listen to this, God knows the date on the calendar today. He knows the exact place where you live. He knows the circumstances that you live in. He knows the emotional roller coaster that's going on in your heart. And brothers and sisters, he knows the heart of an exile. He knows your longing for home. And he knows your name. More than that, as his chosen people, we have all the privileges and the power that come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have his promises made sure. We have the premise of his truth to stand on. We have the power of the resurrection that's at work in us, in our lives, in our hearts, working together for, his, for, for good in all of us who call on him. We have the poise that comes from our confidence in Jesus and his shed blood on the cross. Because God has chosen us, we have assurance of a peace, a peace that, that, that transcends, that goes beyond, that surpasses any kind of peace that we can muster up, any kind of understanding of the things that we're going through that we can muster up ourselves. God says he would give us a peace that goes over all of that. My wife and I were talking just recently saying, even in the midst of everything that's uncertain today, there is a peace that comes with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter wants you to know, indeed God wants you to know, that he has chosen you, that your citizenship, your identity, and your foundation are in him. Brothers and sisters, that's what you long for. Point number three is we have a confident obedience in Jesus Christ. So what do all these truths do for us? What's to be our response? And how do we as aliens and sojourners live in the confidence of our identity in Christ, our being chosen by God the Father? So Peter anticipates the question, and he goes on further to say, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, let's just stop right there, in the sanctification of the Spirit. Now, sanctification is a big word, a big theological term. And unfortunately, it's a Christianese term. I doubt if it's used out, outside of the church very much. But it simply means this. It's a process of change that the Holy Spirit leads, the Holy Spirit conducts in our lives. He's leading us. He's changing us. He's transforming us into the image of Jesus Christ, our Lord. When we make the decision to invite Jesus Christ into our lives, the Holy Spirit comes in and he begins his work of sanctification. It means that he's helping us to move away from sin and to become more like Jesus. Scripture likens it to old clothes and new clothes. Scripture likens it to the old man and the new man, putting them on, dressing in them. You see, sanctification is a lifelong process. We learn to walk in our identity that's found in Jesus Christ. It's a lifelong process. We looked at the foreknowledge and choice of God. That was past tense. That's already done. The sanctification of the Spirit is present tense. It's an ongoing work of him in our lives. In Christ Jesus, listen to this, in Christ Jesus, we live in the realm of the Spirit. That means that he is now at work in every aspect of our lives. Ours is only to see him, to hear his voice, and to follow his leading. That means that every circumstance, every difficulty, every pandemic, 
every closed school, every closed business, every sorrow or fear, every confusion or conflict, every hardship is a platform for the work of the Holy Spirit to go on in our lives. And that's why the Apostle Paul could shout in Romans 8, we know that those who, for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Keep going. In the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ. For obedience to Jesus Christ. There's a decision that we all must make to follow after Jesus Christ. To invite him in as Lord of our lives. That's the beginning. That's salvation and that's the beginning of the sanctification process in our lives. We need to be saved by inviting Jesus into our hearts. That's a one-time decision that we make. But that's not the issue here. That's not the issue here. The issue is the ongoing work of the Spirit. He's constantly turning our lives in the direction of Jesus. When the Spirit leads, we have the choice to follow. Where the Spirit leads is always to Jesus. We're talking about a daily obedience, a daily yielding of our will to, to, to follow his leading. In this way, we become more and more like Jesus. We grow in his life. All things are put in the context of what Jesus wants for me, what Jesus wants for us as a family of God, and what I must do to follow after Jesus in faith. That's the whole context of my life is put in those parameters. What must I do to follow Jesus to be obedient to him today. And finally, Peter gives one more, one more component to the foundation for believers. Listen to this. For obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. You see, Peter recognizes that the sanctification process by the Holy Spirit is lifelong, it's ongoing, and that means that the putting off of sin is not a one-time thing. It means that we're constantly struggling to put off sin and to move towards Jesus Christ. And so we're going to fall down. We're going to fall into sin. Patterns are going to be repeated over and over again until finally we're set free. And Peter says that we need the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus constantly. It's a daily thing. You see, the grip of sin never seems to let go. In fact, we won't be free of that kind of bondage completely until we get home to heaven. But brothers and sisters, I want you to know this. If you are in Christ Jesus, there is continual forgiveness. There is ongoing mercy for those who walk in repentance. The sprinkling of the blood refers to the ongoing offer of grace and mercy. So these foundations take hold in our lives. Sometimes we walk in confidence while other times we seem to be caught in a cycle of sin. We look at our shortcomings today and, and we give up. We look at our past and wonder if we can ever be set free. But Peter and God wants you to know that there is forgiveness for those who call on his name. There is a daily sprinkling of his precious blood. There is the promise of a new day. There's the promise of a second chance, a third chance, and praise the Lord for me, a hundredth chance for redemption, for forgiveness, for, for walking in the newness of life. So let me cl conclude with, with four questions this morning. Four questions. What is your foundation? What is that longing for home that you have? And I believe that's God calling you. That's God calling you home. That's a longing for truth. That's a longing for grace. That's a longing for a solid foundation in a world that's built on shifting sand. That is God inviting you. In light of this new reality that we face, what are your foundations? To what do you turn? You see, God knows your name and he calls you to walk in his truth, calls you to walk in his grace, calls you to walk in his power. What is your foundation? And I have to go back to Peter and his introduction, and I have to ask us, what is your role? What is our role? Whenever somebody is, is nervous because they have to get in front of the church family on Sunday morning and give an announcement or share a testimony, the nerves all come with it. 
One of the things I always tell to somebody when, when they're about to get up in front of the congregation and, and speak, and everybody says they're afraid to speak in public, don't like it. So my advice to them is come up on the stage, plant your feet solidly on the stage, take a big deep breath, and then take charge of the situation. Now I ask you this morning, what is, what is your role? What is God calling you to step into today? How is God calling you to lead your children in these days? Is God calling you to reach out to your neighbor? Is he calling you to be a, a voice of faith and assurance to everyone in, in your world, everybody around you? What is your role as a Christian in your world? Third question, what obedience is God calling you to today? See, I don't know the exact work of the Holy Spirit in your life today. I don't know what he's even saying to you at this moment. Maybe he's asking you to turn off the news and to open up your Bible. Maybe he's calling you to take time away and learn how to pray. Maybe he's causing you to let go of your fear and trust him. Maybe he's calling you to reach out to someone and be a comfort, a voice of assurance to someone else. You see, I don't know the specifics, but I know that he is prompting you. I know that the Spirit is speaking to you even as we speak. And brothers and sisters, I urge you, step into his leading. Lord Jesus Christ, I pray for the family of Valley Evangelical Free Church, wherever they are, the believers in dispersion. I pray that as, as you minister to them in their living rooms today, and wherever they are, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would remind them of their identity in you, of the promises that you have for them, the promises that are all made sure because of what you have done for us, Jesus. And I pray that you would calm our hearts, that you would give us wisdom for daily decisions, that you would give us patience as we interact with one another and look ahead to the coming weeks. Lord, help us to keep our foundations solid in you. Help us to respond to the longing in our hearts to grab a hold of your certainty. So Lord Jesus, I, I pray this, this blessing that Peter, Peter prayed in 1 Peter chapter 1. Valley Free family, brothers and sisters, kids, students, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Amen. Amen. On your way rejoicing.